Okay, we're now joined by Lars Odiska. He's the Chief Operating Officer, 7 Marine ASA. Uh, good morning, Lars. How are you today? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you. Uh, Lars, we uh, have seen your presentation. It was very interesting. I hope I get your thoughts about some of the things uh, uh, within the FPSO sector. Uh, specifically, uh, talking about the deep uh, uh, the deep water uh, drilling, uh, as fields continue to get deeper, can you describe some of the key challenges that come with it? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of challenges as, as we go deeper. I, I guess the most sort of apparent challenge is that once it gets deep, you cannot get divers down there anymore, so uh, you are dependent on anything that happens on the seabed. It has to be remotely operated and controlled from, um, from the surface, and, and that means that uh, there has to be fairly advanced uh, technologies developed and, and a consequence of go all that of course is that uh, if something goes wrong uh, down there or, or there is a requirement for maintenance which there will be it's, it's, it all becomes complicated uh, procedures and um, we work to go through so that in itself of course is, is a challenge uh, by going deep now companies, several companies have developed excellent uh, equipment both for staying down there and, and, and doing what they're supposed to do and also for maintenance and, and emergency preparedness. So I think there's been an outstanding development in technology related to, to the ultra deep waters both when it comes to drilling and, and, uh, and producing the wheels. What we in Savan has focused on is uh, is with over units um, to to stay sort of ahead of the game, uh, both with respect to maintenance and uh, and initial investments. And uh, when it really gets really deep, the, the flexible risers become a major cost element. So we've done quite a bit of work on uh, on steel catenary risers, and we have tailor made over cylindrical hull shape to fit the steel catenary risers and have. Uh, done, like I said, a lot of development work uh, for, for the Savan cylindrical hull with steel catenary risers for, for deep waters. What sort of uh, interesting technologies or innovations do you see lately in the FPSO field and in your opinion, how would it affect the industry? Yeah, it's um, technology and cost-efficient technology is typically what's driving, driving the market. I think you know. You see, I think one of the most dramatic uh, results of technology is what we have seen in the U.S. over the last few years onshore, where where the U.S. only a few years ago was was uh, supposed to become a large importer of natural gas in the form of LNG, and then uh, the technology in terms of um, horizontal drilling and in terms of fracturing suddenly made it possible to develop uh, the um, shale gas in the US and from being a uh, country in desperate need of, uh, of natural gas uh, to close the gap between the traditional production and the demand, uh, the US within two to three years had gas reserves for another hundred years. Mm -hmm. So that shows you how technology dramatically can change uh, a whole market. and. Um, I think we will see the same in uh, offshore. Uh, we don't know exactly what it's going to be, but I think what we've seen is, is subsea production and, and subsea developments have, have dramatically changed, um, changed the, the offshore field and opened up new business prospects for, for a number of companies. Now, one interesting technology that we are also seeing is the cylindrical hull FPSO. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? Yes, the cylindrical hull FPSO, of course, is, is the Savan uh, technology, which was um, patented in 2010 and has been developed since. And the first unit, the Piranema, went into production also in Brazil for Petrobras in 2007. And since then, there has been a number of additional cylindrical units uh, built. And as we speak today, there are 10 units in various stages of production or construction. 
and with Dana Petroleum selecting over, over um, technology for the Western Isles development, that will be unit number 11. Um, so why are these units so popular? Well, I think it's, uh, it's a combination of their very good uh, motion characteristics, particularly in, in severe weather, and the fact that if they are cylindrical, there is no bow or stern, there is just uh, one bow all around. And, and the consequence of that is that we do not need a turret and we do not need a swivel. So we're sitting spread mood and we're moving better than any ship shaped uh, unit in the most severe weather. And the, the cost saving by not having the turret and the swivel is in the range of uh, $150 million. And that is significant for any project. Well, these are very good benefits that you mentioned. Uh, many people will actually be curious, uh, how does it compare uh, to conventional design? Uh, what are the key advantages of cylindrical hull as compared to this conventional design? Yeah, the yeah. Like, like I mentioned, one key benefit is the cost saving in, in the order of 150. Uh, and if you also include savings in, in, um, in complexity and steel weight, you, you may be looking at somewhere between 150 and 200 million dollars for a comparable uh, ship-shaped FPSO, that is significant. The other significant advantage is um, the life of a cylindrical FPSO. Because of the way it's moving, its fatigue life typically is far in excess of a uh, ship-shaped FPSO. And, and particularly, of course, in, uh, if you compare it with a conver converted ship-shaped FPSO. We, we have uh, well above 30 years of fatigue life, while a ship-shaped unit uh, you will look at uh, something like 20, 20, 25 years, I think. Now let's talk about the overall landscape of the industry. Uh, looking ahead, how do you think the FPSO sector will evolve in the next couple of years? Well, it's uh, like we've seen here at the conference here in, in Singapore today, and, and I think like we see at most conferences that I attended that, the future looks brilliant for the next couple of years and then there's a sharp drop off and it's been like that for for as long as I can remember and uh, I think we will see continue to see uh, offshore development with FPSOs and I think we'll see a lot of FPSO because of the inherent advantages of the FPSO you can actually move them around and, and shift them from field to field sometimes the FPSO needs to be upgraded or changed significantly, sometimes a smaller upgrade or, or change in the design uh, only can, can, can be required, but they, they do give the, the owner and the operator a great flexibility as, as, you, as you can move them around. Uh, so, so I think that uh, the future does look bright for, for FPSO owners and operators. The amazing thing is that uh, with this bright future uh, a number of the FPS operators are not making money these days. Mm. We see one project after the other having problems both with costs and schedule. So I think that's something that the, the business really need to look into. How can we produce these units on budget and on schedule and deliver them safely to, to the clients? It's a positive future for FPS. So do you think FLNG shares the same? Uh yeah, FLNG, we've been talking about FLNG for, what is it, 15 years now? <laughs> and it never seemed to happen mm. until another Norwegian company, Flex LNG, right. some, what is it now, four or five years ago, mm. developed their solution mm. and sort of moved, moved that part of the business forward. Uh, they have yet to build their first FLNG. But I think they, they were very clever in that they sort of they moved the, the FLNG business into the next stage. And what we have seen now is that there have been two, two units already, the, the Shell Prelude mm -hmm. uh, project and the Malaysian project. And, um, and I believe that we will see a number of floating liquefaction plants in the future. But but uh, maybe different from, uh, from a more traditional uh, oil FPSO. I think the, the FLNG solutions requires companies with really deep pockets because they are large and complex 
uh, projects, and you really need to do have, to have a strong, both technical and financial background to, to handle those projects properly. Thank you so much for those insights, Lars Odiska, Chief Operating Officer for Seven Marine ASA. Have a great day. Thank you.